Hello my lovely students and welcome to this video on Athene and Minerva. This is a video specifically for the OCR GCSE Classical Civilization Myth and Religion topic, there's a mouthful. Learners should have studied the following, Greek and Roman gods, their responsibilities and symbols and how they are typically represented in ancient Greek and Roman art, which means you need to know what they're famous for and for what the Greeks and Romans specifically worship them their symbols, the objects, animals, and other items with which they're associated, and how they're typically represented in ancient Greek and Roman art. So what they look like, what kind of position they're often shown in, and with whom they're sometimes pictured. So this video will aim to cover all of that. I've also added the stories most famously associated with them for ease of identification and imagery, and to show some of the other characters with whom they're often seen, or to help you understand why they were important to the ancient Greeks and Romans. Athene. <laughs> She's my favourite. So her common epithets are grey-eyed, which seems to suggest wisdom, although sometimes that gets translated as flashing-eyed, which again is like there's a light in her eyes that's wise. She's often Athene of the Golden Aegis, more on that in a minute, goddess of wisdom, goddess of war tactics, Pallas Athene, and victory, Athene Nike or virgin goddess, Athene Parthenos. Her symbols, the things that she's seen most often with, are the fact that she is fully armed with a helmet and a spear. So armor is one of her symbols. A long robe or peplos, that's her dress. A shield with a gorgonaeon on it, that's a gorgon head. It's probably Medusa, as we'll find out later. The tasseled aegis, which becomes a symbol of war or victory. No one really knows what that is, but it generally looks like a kind of very small poncho with snaky tassels all the way around it. Uh, the owl as a sign of her wisdom, specifically the little owl, Athene Noctua. There it is. Isn't it cute? And she's also sometimes seen with a snake. We'll come back to that. Her responsibilities, or what she's known for, First of all, being patron goddess of Athens, one of her most famous attributes. She gives the olive tree as her gift to Athens, and this also becomes a prize at her festival that they have for her on her birthday every year, the Panathenaia. She's also meant to be the inventor of the plough, the ox yoke, the horse bridle, and the chariot. Basically, these are all really clever and useful things of the time, so you probably wouldn't go around saying you'd invented it, without saying you probably got inspiration from the goddess of wisdom. She's also the goddess of women's craft and the goddess of war tactics. And while those two things might sound very opposite, they are basically representational of what a woman's role was and perhaps a man's role was in this time. So women knew the sacred art of weaving specifically, and for men, their intelligence came out in war tactics, being able to protect the city. And so you can see how she comfortably is responsible for the wisdom of both men and women, even though it's in these very different ways. And you might think, wait, but OK, she's got armour on, but how do we see women's crafts? That's the peplos that she's wearing, her dress. That, of course, is a woven piece of fabric. And on her birthday at the Panathenaia, she would be gifted a brand new one that the statue would, in fact, be dressed in. She's also known for being strong, virginal and untouchable. Athene's birth story you might already know if you've already looked at the Zeus Jupiter video. She was born out of Zeus's head after he'd swallowed her mother, Metis, or Wisdom. Zeus had mated with Metis, but he then heard a rumour, a prophecy, that the son he might have with Metis would overthrow him. And given that he was also prophesied to overthrow his own father, he was apt to believe that. So, in order to get rid of Metis, he does the same thing that his father Cronos did, and eats her. And then whilst inside him, Metis gives birth to Athene, and then out of, I don't know, his bone marrow or something, who knows, she makes Athene a full set of armour, 
And then Athene is born fully armed. Zeus has an incredible headache and he begs Hephaestus to knock him over the head and split his head open and actually get whatever pain is inside out. Boom! There she is. He's got Athene putting pressure on him outside. We're not entirely sure what happens to Metis. Either Athene or Zeus somehow absorbs her. Either way, wisdom now runs in the family. Now let's examine how the Greeks and Romans viewed Athene and Minerva separately. The Greeks got her name from, in fact, a Greek word, Athene. It is the name, in fact, of a Greek goddess from a Minoan period, often depicted with a snake and protecting the palace. So Athene has a pre-classical existence. On the Roman side, the name Minerva seems to come from the old Latin Minerva, which actually comes from a proto-Italic word, menes wo, meaning intelligent or understanding. It's also likely that an existing Etruscan goddess called Menerva was also co-opted into becoming the same goddess equivalent as Athene, Minerva, over in Italy. Athene has many epithets in the Greek religion, including Athene Parthenos, Athene the Virgin, she is untouchable and pristine. Athene Polias, Athene of the city, that's in her role as protector of Athens. Athene Tritogenea, Athene third born, or Athene born of Triton, possibly in an earlier story of her birth. Athene Glaucopus, Athene of the gleaming eyes, or possibly owl-eyed Athene, again relating to her wisdom. Athene Nike, Athene of victory, and Pallas Athene, Athene of battle, are the most popular epithets that you would probably hear. The Roman Minerva has two versions of the god. Pallas Athene seems to still be used to describe Minerva when she is being discussed as being in battle. For example, in the epic poem The Aeneid, the poet Virgil calls her Pallas Athene when she's called upon. However, Minerva is very much more the goddess of wisdom in general, and she was more worshipped by the Romans than the Pallas Athene version. For the Romans, their god Mars was far more important to them in warfare. Athene's major temple is very famously the Parthenon on the Acropolis of Athens. The Acropolis meaning the height of the city. Athens wasn't the only city state to have an Acropolis. We can see it here in this image as it looks now, and you can see from that how prominent her temple is. In Rome, her major temple was probably on the Capitoline Hill. She was worshipped in Rome as part of what was called the Capitoline Triad with Jupiter and Juno in a temple on the Capitolium, which probably looks like this in this panel of Marcus Aurelius making a sacrifice. Athene is seen to the Greeks as a woman with armour, a helmet, a shield with gorgon head, a spear, an aegis and an owl. She's also sometimes seen with a snake, as I said earlier. This is to do with the story of Erichthonius, one of the early rulers of Athens. You can see an example of the snake, or the Oikoros Ophis, the sacred snake, in this modern copy of the Athene Vavakaeon statue, which is a version of what is likely to have been the statue of Athene Parthenon in the Parthenon itself. And why, yes, that is a modern-day human in the picture. If you didn't know already, this massive statue replicating the Chris Elephantine, the golden ivory statue that would have been in the Parthenon, is actually here in the Nashville Parthenon. That's right, there is a life-size version of the Parthenon designed and built by architect William Crawford Smith, actually built in 1897 as part of the 10th Tennessee Centennial Exposition in Nashville in America. You can go and visit it. It's an art gallery and it's got this statue in it which was built in 1990 by Alan Lequire. Roman Minerva is also seen as a woman with armour, helmet, shield with gorgon head, spear and aegis or an owl. Athene or Minerva are often pictured with her mortal favourites Heracles and Odysseus. 
This is because they are both heroes who were known for being clever. Heracles might well have been an incredibly strong man, but in his 12 labours, he is known for using his brain often before his brawn, his muscles. And Odysseus is our favourite cheating, almost scumbag of an ancient Greek hero. And the reason why Athene likes them both so much is because she's the goddess of wisdom. So in partnership together, she is the external representation of their talent, their cleverness. Learn that phrase the external representation of talent, because that's really what the gods are in mythology, especially when they are being compared or acting out with mortals. One of the most famous stories for Athene is the naming of Athens, how she became Athens' patron and had it named after her. The first king of Athens, King Cecrops, part human and part snake, <laughs> yeah, wanted to find a patron deity for his city-state. He called on Athene and Poseidon, and their rivalry was so intense that they almost went to war over it. Just as they were about to attack each other, Athene suggested, because she's clever, that they should instead hold a contest for the city, with King Cecrops as the judge. The best gift would win. On the Acropolis, Poseidon struck the earth with his trident, and a spring came up, but it was salty. Not that useful, even if it does perhaps represent dominance over the sea, as it may well have been a metaphor. When it was Athene's turn, she buried a seed which suddenly grew into an olive tree. This turned out to be a much more useful gift, because from that you get olives and oil and wood, and those things link to what Athens was famous for, and steadily becoming even more famous for industry. And so Athene won. Poseidon apparently sent a drought in anger, because it wasn't just his spring that was salty. Another story connected with Athene is about the Gorgonaean, which we mentioned earlier. This head of the Gorgon is attached to her shield, although sometimes also shown attached to her aegis. The Gorgonaean, seen here in its proper apotropaic beauty as quite a fearsome creature, Athene either gave Perseus, the hero, <laughs> hero, inverted commas, the mirror-like shield that he famously had so that he did not have to look at the Gorgon Medusa but only her reflection to stop him being petrified by her gaze, or Athene gave him the idea. Either way, it saved him from being petrified, and that was clever. Athene also guided his sword hand so that he could sever the head with a single stroke. That's quite a regular trope in mythology. If you do something really well, especially when it comes to like aiming an arrow or actually using your sword, it's often said that a god guided you. One version of the story tells that Perseus gave the severed head of Medusa to the goddess after he'd finished using it to, you know, petrify his enemies. And because she had beef with Medusa, which is a whole other story that maybe I'll cover another time, Athene displayed Medusa's head on her shield from then on. It's not entirely clear whether Athene then used it to petrify people with. Maybe that power had, you know, run out by that point. But either way, it's an apotropaic symbol. It's a symbol that's meant to ward off evil. It's pretty fearsome. I imagine that would ward off a lot of evil things. Probably. Now, another story that might not be the most famous story associated with Athene and Minerva, but is important for us getting to know her, is the story of Arachne. Arachne, daughter of Idmon, boasted that she was better at weaving even than Athene. That's clearly hubris. You don't go around saying that you're better at the gods, especially being better at the gods at the thing they're the god of, right? Arachne challenged Athene to a weaving competition, a, a weaving duel, a weave-off, if you will. And then Arachne won. Athene could not find fault with Arachne's woven cloth. Athene was most annoyed, to put it mildly, and Athene turned Arachne into a spider boom. Yes, that's where we get arachnids from. By the way, this is a slightly edited, less gory version of the story, Go on and read Ovid's Metamorphoses if you really want to know the full thing. Overall, what we learn about Athene or Minerva is that she's one of the most important gods. She represents the important talent of both women and men, of the time that is. She's present in a lot of stories as well, and this is because she is the external representation of talent in mortals. And you do not mess with Athene, Minerva. That is a given. 
If you have enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any of the other videos I'll be uploading in this series on the Olympian Gods. You can also check out my other playlists on ancient Greek literature, the Odyssey, and features of literature, texts like similes, and lots of other lovely classics content.